session we just had with uh, Judge uh, Dennis Davis is that we have been schooled, yeah? Um, but also I think, I mean, it is, you know, if, if I were a church going person and we were in church, I would look around and say, it is good to be here, right? <laughs> after, after two years of not having uh, people uh, interacting in person, it is really fantastic to see you um, and, and, and welcome. So the, the panel that we have at the moment is going to be looking at um, competition law developments in Africa over the last two years, right? It has been two years. I know it doesn't feel like it's been two years because we've all been sitting at home and, and eating a lot, um, but it has been two years. And so that's what we'll be talking about. Um, so just to introduce the members of the panel. So I'm Golani, I'm a partner in the competition practice based in Cape Town. Um, I've got Rafael Muru, who is the head of mergers at the Competition Authority of Kenya. Then I've got Walia, who is our partner in Zambia, Lusaka. We've got Dr. Mwemba, who everyone knows, um, the CEO and director of the Comesa Competition Commission. And then we've got Adalberto, who is from the Angolan Competition Authority, who we're very excited um, to welcome to South Africa, the new kid on the block. And uh, so we'll, we'll hear from, from him what's happening in Angola. So without um, wasting too much time, I suppose, is to start off with um, what has been happening in Kenya over the last two years. Rafael, thanks. over to you. Thanks, thanks, thanks. And thanks to Bomans for this uh, occasion. It's glad, it's good to be here back. I'd say, I'd say for everyone after two years, and I'd say it was such a beautiful experience at the airport. I think COVID has made us more African <laughs> that within one click, my passport was stamped and I was through to get into South Africa. So that's a really big plus. And I hope it will continue in the same manner. And uh, in the last two years, there has been great development in Kenya. First of all, I would say, I think Competition Authority of Kenya has become mature, 10 years. Now, I don't think uh, referring to us as a young agency anymore would really fit for us. There are other young agencies in, in, in Africa and globally. And uh, the first element that happened just before COVID was the uh, competition general rules that came into place in 2019. And a key element of that was the merger threshold guidelines that from the last discussion we had here, I think we were still discussing with Comesa and saying, we are very strong in discussions in terms of uh, eliminating double notification. We should be very glad to say that we have eliminated that. And then another key development was that from the thresholds, we were able to create an exemption of certain areas, certain uh, block of transactions that's below 5 million USD, which I believe is a very key component of starting growth and development, especially for SMEs in the, in the country. And uh, from there is that as much as we are doing this, I would, look at, I, I would look at it both ways. As much as we are eliminating the double notification at the moment, what is also happening for us? Tripartite is coming in, uh, CFTA is coming in, we also have EAC is coming into place. So as both as competition agencies and also as stakeholders in this, what are our perspectives in terms of ensuring that we don't go back to the same pit, that it's likely to happen, we cannot uh, wish that away, but we have to be alive and ensure that that is not happening. Then from there is that uh, during this period, the competition authority launched its strategic plan, that strategic plan. This was purely envisioned and done during the COVID period, and it was done in-house. For once is that the agency felt that we no longer need experts. We are the experts. We sat down as, as a team inside there and developed our strategic plan, which has a clear, clear broad mandate of expanding our enforcement frontiers. And what we mean by this, we are looking at new areas of cooperation. We are looking at uh, digital economy, which are the things that are driving whatever is happening right now. I'll take an example of like Kenya, where we find that during COVID and post-COVID, there was increase in person-to-person -person mobile payments by over 50%, actually by 53%. So where do we come in as competition regulators in such elements? So we, we are looking at new, those areas critically. We are also looking at the area of cooperation. As you look at the economy, the markets are really shifting. We are moving away from the traditional market that before COVID, we could see a steel manufacturer only relying on making phone calls to make delivery. Nowadays, they are, their customers are going online, placing orders, and orders are actually being produced from that online platform for the orders for what is required specifically. So are we just looking at the traditional steel manufacturer, but now there's a clear platform they are using to deliver their goods. A key component of what we see in online pharmacy and food delivery, which I find is also, it's cutting across even in South Africa and other countries. 
that before I had to walk into a pharmacy, walk into a chemist to order for medicine. This is changing. So in the strategic plan, these are some of the areas we are looking at. And I was very glad to listen to the giant actually point out that this is not just purely a competition issue. It will not be looked as purely a competition issue. There are elements of data protection, the elements of telecommunication that it requires collaborative approach is that competition authorities will not provide solutions for these challenges alone, but they can be drivers because they also have a clear, bigger approach and understanding of what is happening in the economy. Rather than being a sectoral regulator is that they cover all sectors. So it will require a more broader approach towards that level. The other element I would say that we are looking at, which will be a major development is that as a Kenyan Competition Authority, we are trying to simplify our margin notification. And this is an area where we require stakeholders to really put, come in with their input. I would indicate that before COVID, we had already started testing our online systems in terms of filing online. And I would be glad that uh, when people closed, I remember I was getting phone calls that, can we make a notification? And I was telling people, yes, go online. We are available. We never closed, actually. I believe we're one of the agencies that never closed even a single day because of COVID. And that we really take pride in. However, moving forward, we are trying to simplify our major notification and our target, I believe as the head of majors, I'll be very happy to have the simplest major notification globally. That would be a very big plus, but it will be more data intensive because we look at our analysis now is not going away from the narrative. I don't want you to explain to me as what has been described by the judge, we are looking at public interest in terms of pure analysis competition wise, not just looking at a narration, and telling me that uh, likely not to affect employment. So how do I analyze that? <laughs> we need the numbers. So we'll make our analysis more data intensive, but also simplify what you put in so that if you go to do a filing, you're able to put in your data very easily for that. The other key perspective that has happened over that period is the development of joint venture guidelines, which also I believe we are, we are a pioneer in Africa and globally. And we are trying to provide more clarity. We have seen over COVID period that companies are no longer coming together just to merge, but they are looking at areas of building each other. We are finding a bus company coming together with a hailing up to try and uh, deliver more, move more passengers and move more people. So instead of them coming together and forming one company, they're looking at areas of collaboration. So we are trying to provide better clarity in terms of what we consider full functioning joint ventures, how we consider the thresholds for that. It might not be a very rosy road at the beginning, because also we are trying to, to come up with clear interpretation of what we have. We'll have back and forth between the stakeholders and ourselves. But I believe from that pioneering, and I'm seeing even the other competition agencies globally, are really getting interested in what we are doing. And then from there is in terms of also whether some of the joint ventures would fall under RTPs. And a key component of our guidelines is that in terms of JVs, we are requesting parties kindly seek advisory opinions for this. Rather than actually implementing and saying that the guidelines have given a full description of this, we are offering the advisory opinions for that for free. And then from there is... Uh, the, in terms of uh, digitization, I would say that uh, the authority is also going further forward. Now we, this February, uh, last Feb February, beginning of February, we just launched our mobile app, which is still also undergoing an upgrading. The key elements of this is that the authority deals with both competition and consumer issues. So we are looking at better times where people can report RTPs anonymously more easily. Companies can make complaints. Consumers can make their complaints. When you file your mergers, you're able to track. You don't have to call Raphael when he's on leave and ask him where, what's the current status of the mergers that you can go online and see. You have now a complete filing. Your 60 days account has started. So you just need to check. Unless now the app is not working, which has, not been, has been unlikely for our systems, is that you're able to track yourself and have feedback on your case that you know by this day, if at all we have moved forward, the determination will tell you by March 20th, expect you are. The, the, the determination of your transaction. So those are some of the changes that we are seeing and what we are looking forward to as competition authority. Thank Fantastic. You. Before, before we move on from here, just, just two things. If you can just talk to us through you know, sort of the CAK's um, current practice of thinking regarding penalties and criminal sanctions, um, both from a, a mergers perspective and an RTP perspective. And then um, to just close off is on market surveillance and um, detection of non-notified mergers. Thanks. In terms of penalties, I would say the authority has grown full board. We have grown fully mature. We have come up with the penalties and finding guidelines that cut across all our illegal practices I would consider that elements that are anti-competitive, consumer infringements. We have collapsed all the penalties and everything and fines that are covered in the act under one document. And the main reason for this is to provide a one-stop shop. 
And from where I started that, we are 10 years old now. I would say right now, we are no longer saying that a company would come in and say, we are not aware of the competition law in Kenya. It's no longer not being aware, but it's now purely ignorance for you not to be aware that you can't go and seek legal counsel on someone and that you're not looking at competition issues. These issues are all over the media. They are over you. So as, a, as also as a business practitioner, it's now no longer just uh, you whisking away that we don't deal with competition matters. Over the last period is that we have penalized companies even during the COVID period. I wouldn't go to mention the exact names, but what we are looking at is more compliance from, from we expect more compliance from, from, from stakeholders. And also the a main challenge we find is that when you're caught on the wrong, sometimes it might be of pure ignorance. I find that there are companies that have been on the wrong because not the management knew about it, but it's a simple employee who was doing something that actually went on and I as the owner or the business owner, I'm finding that, look, we're increasing our profit, so let's continue with this. So it's not always that because you're caught on the wrong, that you have to prove you're right. You look for all ways of, of proving that you're right. And we have found that companies have still been penalized and have gone ahead and still grown in the economy. And they have also become ambassadors of competition law, which you find it to be, to be to a good perspective. In terms of detection, we have really grown that uh, we are no longer relying on the old traditional ways that someone would walk in and say, I'm suspecting this. We have seen cases whereby parties have been trying to comply with a matter that has already been implemented, for instance, for mergers, mm -hmm. now filing like it's a fresh notification, which I find to be very, very, very wrong. It's better you come clean and say this one was implemented and then you can move forward. In terms of RTPs, I would say over the COVID period, there was a bit of lax because of the way of you can do the don't read the key parameters of what you do with the investigations. However, you have been able to conduct certain investigations, which I believe in the next uh, six to 10 months, you'll be hearing of what you have done in it. So we are really trying, and we are not just after penalizing. What we are looking at is, are you complying? Is the, is the economy benefiting from our actions? Because I would not, I would not, feel, bad, I would not feel very bad to say, yeah, we penalized a company, 1 million USD, and yet the ordinary consumer is not benefiting from lower prices, is not benefiting from innovation. So our whole purpose of the regime is actually to ensure that consumers, by the end of the day, benefit from what we are, from what we are doing. Sure. Thanks. Um, I know, I, I mean, I said it was going to be the last question, but I mean, I did talk about church and, you know, so we'll, we'll do a church thing here. We, we, you know, questions keep coming. Um, final one is, is just, I mean, you, you, you uh, when we're preparing for this, as we've mentioned about sort of arbitration, um, that is part of the process that the CAK is, is introducing um, in dealing with, with penalties. Can you just talk us a bit more about that? Yes, in, in, in terms of arbitration is that with our judicial system, it's really focusing heavily on, because our, our way of sanctions covers both ways. There's a penalty process and also there's also the criminal sanctions that can be done. And uh, we have seen instances where we have tried to apply, to, to impose criminal sanctions. And uh, what, what, what also the authority is looking at is really, rather than going the whole criminal way, is that as a judicial system is trying to be very strong on settling, especially such of this economic issues in terms of arbitration is that can we have arbitration take first role after the matter has reached that level but we still take penalty as a first first landing spot and uh, it only goes to criminal mainly when we find there's some uh, level of resistance in compliance so for instance if you have asked for your submissions and parties have completely declined so we, we are left with no other, no other option that that's we, we we fall in for the criminal option but also a key thing i would say is that we have seen also parties really taking up the tribunal way. And this has gone even when matters are halfway, matters have not been concluded. We have seen uh, this, uh, essentially this is really helping to strengthen the competition enforcement in the economy, that you find the decisions, some of them even, I, I would say one of the elements that we are very proud as an agency is that the decision that we make is now made more public because at the tribunal, the matters are open for everyone to scrutinize and have a review of them. And once the stories are being picked up from that level is that it's helping enforce the competition law. And I'm finding that the matters going to tribunal, parties are also willing to come back and actually set on those matters. Sure. What, what, what I would uh, say would be critical is that parties should not think of using the tribunals for forum shopping, that uh, I want to delay the matter as much as possible. I know X will not be happy for this, that you want to make more money as a lawyer. <laughs> so you go to arbitration file, you go to the tribunal, then come back, come back. You know, you'll still come back to CAK. Mm -hmm. That the faster the matter is concluded, the more it's beneficial to the public. 
the more of dragging of the matter does not benefit the public at the end because it's not the competition authority against the company it's more of are the public are there issues that your consumers could have been benefiting better sure. could they have been enjoying better prices so for us any time delay is actually justice denied to the public rather than it being the reverse of it we see it not being as like we won the case but for that one period the matter was going on did the consumers benefit from lower prices did they get inferior goods. Right. So that, that's our main worry that even at the tribunal level, we are trying to have the matters cleared as soon as possible mm -hmm. so that benef the benefit can be accrued to the, to the public. Fantastic. Thanks. Well, yeah, um, let me come to you. I mean, the, um, the competition authority, CSPC, has been quite active over the COVID period. Um, can you just uh, update us on, on what's been happening there? Okay. Thanks. Thanks, X. Um, Yes, indeed. The, the CCPC has been quite active. And uh, if you're aware with the type of work that they do, they have been quite an, uh, an active enforcer of competition law in Zambia. And during the COVID pandemic, we definitely uh, saw that they continued with their operations. So for example, on the merger side, they started to allow for electronic filing of applications. So it was one of the commissions that did not uh, have any disruption to, to his services. They also continued with uh, investigations into various restrictive business practices, as well as abuse of dominance. And um, what was actually impressive to see was them actually being cognizant of the fact that we were in a pandemic and how that was actually affecting uh, businesses going forward. So you will find, for example, that um, uh, you know, they had an increase in investigations and abuse of dominance. And that was because I think they had an increase of complaints relating to excessive pricing. But what we did see was that, you know, 18, uh, 18 enterprises were said to have abused their dominance um, in various markets. But the CCPC did find following investigations that the conduct of these enterprises was actually justifiable in the circumstances. So one of the cases, for example, was uh, in relation to an ethanol supplier who um, was alleged to have been excessively pricing ethanol. I think the price was alleged to have been initially $1.9 per liter. And then I think the allegation was that the price had increased to $7. Um, when the CCPC did conduct its investigations, they found that actually the price was $3.90, but um, it was a justifiable increase because of the, the pressures that the supply chains had suffered during this pandemic uh, period. And Zambia being an, an import-based country, we saw uh, the supply chain being uh, greatly disrupted and it affecting the output of various businesses. So for example, I think in that particular case, uh, you know, there were arguments being made that you know, the importation of ethanol uh, on, you know, uh, on an airline was no longer the same price because we had limited airlines flying into the country. So that was uh, a, a positive way of seeing how uh, the CCPC was integrating uh, the results of a COVID-19 pandemic into, um, you know, the, the ongoing businesses and the pressures that businesses were actually facing. Um, generally, what we also saw was a reduction in mergers. Uh, I think there was generally more regional uh, mergers, but there was a reduction of mergers uh, in Zambia. Because unfortunately for Zambia, in the past two years, in addition to having the COVID pandemic, we also had um, almost like an, a recessive economy. And that was because uh, I'm sure some of you might, might be aware that we, we, we were, you know, um, defaulting on, on, on our sovereign bonds. So the state of the economy was quite poor and foreign direct investment was not coming in. So we saw that uh, impact on mergers. Um, but at least we saw that on a regional basis, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Mwemba will speak to this, that there was actually an increment on that. Um, generally on restrictive business practices, there was a reduction in, um, in the cases investigated by the by the commission, but they attribute it to having an increased awareness by businesses, um, which uh, is, is great. But what we also saw is that there were a lot of um, investigations into catalytic behavior. So um, some fish fingerling producers 
seven of them were actually fined for, for cartel behavior because I think there was price fixing in the, in the manner in, in which they were doing their business. Um, the, the CCPC found that there was no justifiable reason as to why they needed to collaborate particularly or have similar pricing. Um, so we saw those seven um, producers being fined. One of them was fined 10%, the others were fined 9%. It is not clear uh, why one was fined a higher amount. Um, we also saw cement companies being uh, fined. Um, in this particular case, we saw, and, and this is in the public domain, we saw Dangote take advantage of the CCPC's leniency program, which um, is something that is out there. They have been urging businesses to take advantage of that, uh, where th th there's uh, any restrictive business practice going on. Uh, so they took advantage of that. And uh, as a result, Lafarge Cement and Mpande Limestone were both fined 10% of, um, of annual turnover. We understand that these cases are currently on appeal, but those are some of the cases that um, the CCPC has been dealing with on the restrictive business practices. Super. So can you talk us through, I mean, what's, what's the um, CCPC's approach at the moment to, to exclusivity? So the CCPC's approach is that they see exclusivity as being um, an issue in the sense that uh, it is allowable if you can be able to uh, provide a business justification for exclusivity. However, uh, what we have seen also, and uh, sorry, this segues into uh, agreements and seeking authorization, um, arising from the COVID pandemic, as well as the state of, of the economy, the CCPC has been uh, enforcing the provisions of section 14 of the act, which require businesses to uh, obtain authorization and approval of their agreements. And, um, th and in as much as the idea is to ensure that those agreements are not uh, anti-competitive in nature. Um, so what that means is that if you have a horizontal agreement and you collectively in that agreement supply 30% of the market or you're acquiring 30% of the market, you must then seek authorization from the CCPC to proceed with your agreement. In relation to vertical agreements, the threshold is uh, reduced to 15% for each individual um, party to the agreement. Supplying or acquiring, you then need to obtain authorization. And what we've seen is that the CCPC has taken quite a broad interpretation of, um, of authorization under section 14, which basically means that should you have, or should you meet that market threshold, then your agreement should be subject to authorization. We obviously think, we don't agree with that interpretation because it would then mean that um, for players that have, or that meet certain uh, thresholds, they might then have to uh, notify almost all their agreements that they're entering into, which I think uh, probably um, is against, uh, you know, is probably not business efficient. Uh, we hope that they'll definitely clarify these later on and we, and we can have guidelines on that. But, um, you know, when we speak to the CCPC, they basically are saying that if your agreement has any exclusive provisions, for example, that would be critical for you to seek authorization. Because then what that does is that it reduces the, uh, or mitigates any uh, potential action that might come later in relation to whether you have actually been involved in any restrictive business practices. Right. So, I mean, similar to, to the CAK, the CCPC also has a, a dual mandate of competition and consumer protection. Yes. Um, and I mean, what we're seeing, um, what Rafael is talking about is that part of that has led the CAK to really um, up its game in terms of uh, digital tools available to it. You know, there's an app. Um, I mean, I think they're trying to put Facebook out of business. But so, so what has um, the CCPC been doing on the consumer protection front as well as um, sort of uh, generally digitizing? So they have recognized, the CCPC has recognized that they, they need to digitize uh, their operations. We haven't gotten to a point, I think, where um, Raphael uh, and the app, we haven't had that yet. But um, so, so far, what we do have is 
uh, complaints can be made. And uh, I'm not sure that there are any restrictions on the delivery of the complaints. But when it comes to consumer protection, there has been an increased awareness uh, by the, from the public on their rights under the competition law, which also houses consumer protection. And what they have seen is uh, an increase in the number of consumer complaints, such that um, they have almost 3,000 cases that they have to deal with relating to consumer protection. Uh, the, the, the CCPC ha has indicated that um, as part of their growth, they need to digitize as well as increase their capacity because I think carrying out investigations in the various spaces is also, uh, they're also noticing that a lot of the information is being housed digitally and they need to be able to increase the capacity and in able to deal with those, um, those challenges. Super. Yeah. And, and what are the, the CCPC's priorities for this year? So the, the CCPC's priorities for this year, the way we see it is, um, uh, as, I, as I had mentioned, authorization of agreements to try and uh, prevent restrictive business practices by uh, players actively seeking out uh, the authorization of the CCPC. And just as Raphael had mentioned, uh, I think what they are trying to do is to encourage compliance over uh, trying to penalize parties, which is um, a, a huge positive for us uh, on, on, on the part of the, of the CCPC that has quite some heavy fines. Uh, but also consumer protection is, um, is, is key for them as well. Uh, in light of the awareness by the public, but also the number of complaints that they, they, that they, that they do get. So this is an area that uh, a lot of businesses have to be aware of because um, you find that the, the nature of complaints um, sometimes will border on you know, contract and the breach of contract. But now you have the intervention of this consumer protection law which uh, in addition to any you know, liabilities that you may have under contract, you then are liable to a potential 10% of annual turnover as well for a breach of a consumer, consumer protection right. So I think that's uh, one of the things. And maybe just to also mention, um, we, so I think the CCPC tends to have quite a seamless um, uh, inter, in, uh, interaction with the Commercial Competition Commission. And I think we ha they've never had uh, any formal uh, legal provision supporting that relationship. Uh, I, I think they, had an, uh, an, they have an MOU. But what we have uh, seen, and I think the indication is that they intend to uh, domesticate the Commercial Competition Regulations so that that relationship is then supported by the law. Um, I think there are a couple of lawyers who have tried to argue in the past that, um, you know, the, the, that Comesa does not have any jurisdiction in Zambia yet because of the lack of domestication. But um, I think because of the, the relationship between the CCPC and the Comesa, uh, and Comesa Competition Commission, um, you know, we have still been required to notify regional dimension mergers to the Comesa Competition Commission. But the idea now is that uh, it will now be backed by law and we, we, we definitely are looking forward to that as well. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll skip uh, Dr. Mwemba and, and go to, to Angola first. Um, now, I mean, Angola is the new kid on the block um, and, and uh, one of the, um, it, it, it's, it, it's a similar, I suppose, to a lot of the regulators here. It is a regulator that is um, open to to having conversations with, with business as well as, as lawyers. Um, but one of the, I suppose, early criticism of the regime, at, at least from a, a, a merger control perspective, has been how formalistic it is. Um, when you file a merger, there's this thing called consularization. Um, so, so can you just talk us through the institutional structure of the, of the uh, ACA, um, its approach and, and why it actually uh, has to be as formalistic as, as it is? Yes, thank you. It's a big honor to be here and uh, for the first time. Um, I, I, I ask for pardon because I will have a delay to speak because I think in Portuguese and then I translate to speak in English. <laughs> so sorry for that. Another thing is uh, for us, all we do in Angolan Competition Authority, it's a development because we are very young. We have only three years um, two of them with COVID pandemic. So 
every step we say, hey, we are here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are now, we have a, 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 a news. Uh, the first one is that we are transforming in an independent agency. So now we are uh, inside the Minister of Finance and we already have the order and we are working in papers to send to National Assembly, first to the president and then to the National Assembly to approve it um, as, as an independent agency. So this could be um, a great uh, opportunity for us because we are struggling with another economic uh, politics in the government. Uh, one of them, for example, is the privatization process that is in course. And when we try to help them to make the term of reference, to choose the better companies that, that doesn't limit the competition, but sometimes it's not easier because the another agency wants to receive money quickly with the companies interested in assets, but we are looking for the market and this can be confusing. Another political issue that we had in the past, but we are surveilling, was a local content on oil and gas sector. We helped them to drafting the rule, and after that, we struggling to, to see the list of uh, companies and uh, products and services that could be in this uh, very, very um, closed market. And this could be great for us uh, pulling out of the government. Um, other problems that we are facing is um, with financial recipe. We only, uh, in the past, uh, quite a year ago, we, we received a, a, a fees for the measures. But in the past, we only count with um, general uh, money for the government. So it's a few because Angola is now in a struggling economic and financial problems and these um, make problems to us. Um, and we, we are trying um, a model of financing that the other uh, sectors, uh, regulators, uh, pass by a little recipes for the companies that they ask for licensing and authorization and pass to authority because we have uh, transversal powers with all markets. Um, we are also, uh, in, in about two years ago, we approved our form that is very long, as you already said, but we have a formal procedure that companies can ask with a few information informally if they need to notify or not the, the, the operation. So it could be uh, more easier to the companies and only fill it the long form if necessary. Um, another thing is we are trying to make a digital our process, such as notifying. We are in trying version of notifying uh, mergers and also to report antitrust. Uh, it's very important to us because the two big um, investigations in antitrust are coming from reports for other companies uh, in big sectors, and we are uh, closing the investigation. We already closed the investigation process uh, about two years, and now we will uh, accuse the companies that um, we investigated. So. It's a short. <laughs> oh. So, so I mean, yeah. the, the sort of, which is unusual, I think, for most regulators. I mean, the ACA at a very early stage started to and, and published um, guidelines um, uh, for a number of uh, areas. Can you just talk us through that and the thinking behind sort of right off the starting block, already putting in place guidelines? Yes, we are. Uh, this is other problem. We are facing problems to understand what is our work on the market because some regulators think that we are robbing our powers <laughs> and it's very difficult sometimes to articulate uh, there is a few regulators that are more openly to the angolan competition authority but uh, some of them are very very hard to us don't cooperate and uh, sometimes 
make a political treatment. <laughs> so uh, it's it's very complicated sometimes. But we have um, a big program to interact and making protocols to give information and receive for them because some of the sectors are very, very complicated, such as electrical sector or oil and gas, and we need them to understand the, the, the market. Okay, um, so I think let's, let's go to Kermesa and we'll, we'll come back. Um, Dr. Mwemba, you've been very busy. Um, we said uh, it was mentioned that uh, Kermesa has now Im uh, imposed its first penalties. Um, I don't know if uh, the new broom is sweeping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so can can you just uh, update us and uh, you know, I mean, and also me for you personally, it's been a new journey, right? You've just started as the CEO and director. So how? So, so the last two years also start off and coincide with the start of your tenure. Um, so how has that been? Well, quite an interesting question. Uh, obviously, yes, the last two years, the beginning of the last two years is about me. The first thing is uh, the last time I was here, I was a very young man. So <laughs> I'm coming back here as a very old man. That's what has happened in the last two years. So I was that chatting with Tamara initially that put my picture on, uh, on their LinkedIn profile. A very young, handsome me. Very, very young and handsome. <laughs> Even when I saw that, I was saying, but this is my name, but who is the guy here? <laughs> uh, so I was telling Tom that uh, this would be very misleading. People would have seen that picture and when they see the real me, say, but it's not that old man. Here. <laughs> so that's what has happened to me, obviously, in the last two years. And of course, as you said, uh, the last time I was here, I was the head of majors at the commission. Uh, uh, I'm now the CEO. So yeah, quite an interesting, uh, interesting journey. But when you get to the commission itself and its work, what is it that has happened uh, significantly uh, in the last two years? Before I come to that, I need, first of all, to caution uh, Walia here that uh, you see uh, in, uh, in the UK, Lord Denning cautioned businesses and lawyers. Uh, I don't know if that caution still stands today, uh, looking at what has happened with all this Brexit and everything. But Lord Denning said businesses, UK businesses, who question the supremacy of the EU law, do this at their own peril. And he stated that this EU thing, this EU law, is like an oncoming tide. It flows down the estuaries and it will engulf all those that are resisting. <laughs> yeah. So it's the same thing with uh, this business of Comesa, member states. I think we should be moving past that now. Uh, we've moved beyond Comesa now. We are even talking about the tripartite. We are talking about the continental free trade area. So those are some of the bigger things that we even come bigger than Comesa. So I think it's high time we accepted this is the trend in the world. And uh, one of my, my, my board members from Kenya actually last week taught me some very good uh, terms. He talked about, uh, Sunday, what did he say? Robotic what? Robotic justice and substantive justice. He said, look, even as lawyers, let's stop these things of finding technicalities to challenge the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Let's be looking at the substance and the objective of what is happening and what, why the law exists. So I thought I should caution Bwali and the Zambians on that, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. No, we're always on the same page. Exactly. Uh, always, uh, okay. always on the same page. Now in Comesa, uh, in the last two years at uh, uh, Tolani, I think our approach has changed. As you may know, uh, previously our approach was very soft and we, 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 we used to call it soft enforcement. So we are more on awareness raising, uh, uh, more on uh, uh, when parties are on the wrong side of the law, we would bring them, talk to them, and then see how uh, uh, we, we, we address their concern. I would call it in the best interest of the parties, not in the best interest of the commission, of course. But um, uh, over the last two years, we thought we have done quite a lot now. Everyone, as Rafael uh, said, uh, in the case of Kenya, everyone should know about the Comesa Competition Regulations and the Comesa Competition Commission. So it is now not business as usual. Where there is an infringement, we have to talk to parties. Where there is an infringement, we will whip. That is the, the, that is the position. And that's why you have seen uh, uh, the, the, the fines that you are talking about in one instance where parties um, uh, failed to file the major within the required uh, period of time. And that to us, uh, there was no excuse for the parties to have failed to do that. 
was as you may know, most of you uh, uh, in here, the lawyers in here, we've been very, uh, we've, uh, we've had a very relaxed approach uh, to that third day period. Uh, we've said, as long as you've uh, uh, engaged the commission, uh, whatever engagement has, even uh, an issue of high sandia, uh, we have a major that will be filing in the next three months. That's the beginning of the notification process. And it cannot be more lenient than that. So if parties, even with that very relaxed and lenient approach, still fail to file the major or even engage us, we find that to be blunt and disregard of the regulations. And we thought some sanity should begin uh, to come in the market. So those parties were, 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 were fined. And then the other one, uh, obviously, it was uh, um, a breach of the undertakings that the, the, commissions, uh, uh, the commission uh, uh, received. I would use the word received because the undertakings were given by them when we, when we identified those concerns. They went back to the market and thought the undertakings were just uh, a formalistic, uh, casual thing to sign. And they went to the market and did the exact opposite. Obviously, again, that's a blatant disregard of their law. And we are saying, we'll not continue with business as usual. Where I would have caught them and said, no, you've done this. We, we think you should do it. We needed to show that uh, as such will not be tolerated anymore. Uh, and obviously, uh, 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 from that comes in another point I would want to share. But uh, we've enhanced our transparent um, uh, uh, mechanisms and uh, framework within the commission, where you have decisions made by the or, or recommendations made by the investigative wing of the commission are actually uh, sometimes overridden by the by the decision of the of the CID, and also where decisions have been made by the the CID are appealed. To the, to the appeals board of the commission. So for example, in the case I'm talking about on the uh, breach of those undertakings uh, by, by those parties, the commission had actually recommended a very hefty fine, uh, but the CID disagreed with us. And they put in a, a lot of their reasoning why they disagreed with us. And I think they reduced the amount to about half of what we had, uh, half of what we had recommended. So. We were not happy, obviously, but that shows something also within the commission that there is some kind of uh, separation of powers, uh, independence and accountability that we can not just wake up today and say, Derek, you've done this wrong. You have been fined one million dollars and that is what caused. So Derek, even before he appeals, the CID, uh, our own CID would review that decision or that recommendation and agree with us or not, I think, which is a plus. In terms of uh, the CID itself, even them, uh, their, their, their decision is, is, is not final. So we've had situations where the CID has uh, made decisions on some of the undertakings and those decisions have been appealed to the appeals board of the, of the commission. And uh, we, 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 await, uh, we await the outcome of the appeals board to see if they'll agree with their CID sure. uh, or not. Yeah, so I think some of those are the things that have been happening in the last two years. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I suppose, I mean, Walia also mentioned that uh, Zambia is looking to domesticate um, the, the, the Kemesa competition regulations. So are you seeing a lot more sort of harmonization um, within the Kemesa region and more and more member states um, seeking to, uh, to domesticate the regulations? Uh, yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, so, for example, we have a project with Mauritius currently, uh, quite, quite a huge project with them, where we are uh, uh, reviewing the legal framework in Mauritius and then to uh, also making sure that it expressly, uh, and I should be uh, very uh, clear here, when we say we are reviewing the framework in Mauritius so that it expressly gives effect to the regulations of COMESA. It does not mean then that we are saying, or you should go and say, I said then the regulations have no force there. But it's exactly to address what Walia is bringing here. So that in the future, this conversation is done and dusted. So we have that project with Mauritius. We have uh, a, a similar project with Djibouti. I was just with the Malawan Competition Authority at, at, at the office. Uh, uh, today, is, today is Thursday. Yeah, I was just with them at the office uh, the day before yesterday on Tuesday. So we have, we've begun uh, the same uh, talks with them. You talked about, uh, did you talk about it or I read? Or is it uh, Derek? Yes. Derek talked about the Malawans, uh, uh, obviously, uh, looking at the amendments to their law. So we are working together with them on that one. In fact, it's a project that we will uh, uh, support and fund. And those are some of the issues that uh, 
uh, we, 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 we will come uh, from that project. And then we have other countries like the DRC, uh, where we've done quite a lot of work uh, from establishing, I think most of the work started around 2016, most of you may not know, there is the commission helping them. They are at the stage where they are almost functional today. And the issues we are talking about of domestication and what they doesn't they don't arise there. And um, uh, yeah, uh, Tolani, I think we've been speaking. We've been asking me what is the state of uh, the DRC Competition Authority and, the, and, the, and their operation. And I think I told you that, in as far as I'm concerned, they say they are operational, uh, but I think there's still a number of things to put in place uh, before they become uh, uh, fully operational. So they had visited me as well. I think Tuesday was a very busy day. They had visited me as well uh, of, over the weekend. Uh, I was with them up to Tuesday. And I posed that very same question. I said, lawyers are asking me, what is the exact position, even if I know that I've been holding you by the hand to make sure that you become operational? So I said, no, look, we're operational. <laughs> but uh, but uh, so if someone brought a major today, would you be able to receive that major? I said, yes, yes, yes. Do you have a major notification form, for example? I said, you need to help us on that. <laughs> so then I said, okay, then we have a little bit of some work to do. Yeah. So uh, this, the institutional framework is there, but I, 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 I don't think I, I would be comfortable here to say they are, they are uh, operational. They, they are yet to be fully operational. Right. And, and, and then, I mean, I suppose similar to, to Zambia with the Article uh, 14 process of authorization. Yeah. Um, Comesa also has its Article Twenty, is it? Yes. yes, yes. Um, and so, what's the thinking around that? Is 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 that something that the Commission is now wanting to really push forward as an avenue that businesses should be using? That's a very good question, and in fact, it also um, uh, forces me to reiterate the point I'm talking about: weeping children that are very disobedient. You say even the Bible says, "Spare the rod, spare the rod, and spoil the child," something like that. <laughs> yeah. So our Article Twenty actually is a very good tool. In fact, there is a big difference between our Article Twenty and uh, Section Fourteen of the Zambian Act. So our Article Twenty does not uh, is not mandatory. You are, you are not. You are, you, it is not mandatory that when you enter into these agreements, then you should uh, approach the Commission. Okay, it's very voluntary, unlike their, their section 14. And Derek will agree with me that there was, I think, a transaction that we were looking at. I think it involved MTN or something. I told you I'm becoming an old man now, so I don't remember some of these cases exactly. By name, but I think it involved MTN, and it was uh, some kind of uh, joint venture or something like that, an agreement, which from our side, we said, in fact, uh, from our side, we offered an advisory opinion. It was not even an application under that Cotwain. So from our side, we said, we don't see uh, 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 anything wrong with this. I think it's a transaction that can, that can proceed. But uh, in the Zambians, because the Zambians actually uh, referred that case to us. So it was not Derek bringing it to us. It was the Zambians who referred it to us and thought it had the regional dimension because of MTNR's operations in a number of countries. But when we looked at it, we found that uh, there were no issues from our side. But then the Zambians wrote to us and said, well, if you find no issues from this, then we'll pick it because Commerce has not picked it. <laughs> because under Section 14 for us, it's mandatory that these people should notify. They could have only accept, escaped notification if it was uh, considered by, by Commerce. So our Article 20 is voluntary. But where parties are not so sure, really, uh, I think it's important that they take advantage of that Article 20 so that once the commission gives you its position, they go ahead. Tomorrow, they will not come back and say this is an anti-competitive agreement. And if you say door that is voluntary, why not use it? So if you fail to use that door and uh, uh, out of our own volition, we find that something is wrong. And we'll remind you that uh, uh, Tolani, you should have come and... Uh, under 20, but you, 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 you neglected to do this and you pay the consequences for, right. uh, for, for that conduct. Mm -hmm. So it's something that indeed we're encouraging uh, 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 parties to take advantage of yeah, because uh, obviously it, is, it, it, it assists them in an event that something goes wrong in the market later on. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, you, you, you sort of mentioned that Zambia um, referred the case to the, to the CCCC. So... Are you seeing more and more um, referrals from member states, um, whether it's from a merger context, um, uh, RTPs, and also vice versa, where the commission has either opened investigation or has received a merger, member states say, no, 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 bring, bring it to us rather than 
that the uh, commission review? Yes, of course. Uh, we, we, we've seen uh, in the recent past quite a number of cases that uh, uh, member states have referred to the commission because they thought uh, 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 there was a regional uh, dimension there. For example, uh, it's, it's an active case, so I will not give a lot of details. But for example, we have uh, one case we are looking at in the shipping, uh, shipping sector, and that case was referred to us by the Mauritian Competition Authority, and I think the Kenyans also know about it. And so it was referred to us by the, the not the Mauritian, the what, seashells would, Mauritius is Mauritian, seashells would be what? Seashell what? Seashell what? That word. Uh, <laughs> so from, the, from seashells. <laughs> yeah. So we, we, we have a number of those, uh, Egypt, and, and, and I think Egypt is an interesting case. I know, Talan, you have a, a question on that. But Egypt has also referred quite a number of cases to the commission, uh, 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 both majors and, 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 uh, and uh, restrictive business practice uh, uh, cases. The, the, the opposite uh, is also true that the commission has in instances where it thought it had no jurisdiction on a case referred it to national competition authorities. We've done that in the past with Mauritius, we've, we've done that with uh, Zambia, we've done that with Kenya, we've done that with Malawi. In fact, we have one current case uh, now uh, that, 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 that when I get back to the office, I'll be writing to the Malawans that this should, this should be your case. So we are doing that as well. But from a major's point of view, I think it's very important, and I think Sandia yesterday mentioned that in our remarks. Uh, from a, a major's point of view, the sad part with our regulations is that uh, um, it, it gives member states uh, an avenue to uh, call for a referral of a transaction where they think that transaction would have uh, a more disproportionate effect in that country compared to the rest of the common market. And I think a number of countries have used that before. Kenya has used that before. Uh, Zimbabwe has used that before. Mauritius has used that before. Zambia has tried in the, I think three times I rejected that. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, because uh, I didn't see much merit, but maybe I've been very hard on the Zambians, I don't know. But I rejected that on three occasions. Uh, so from the member state point of view, the, the regulations provide that avenue for them to request for that referral. But we cannot voluntarily refer a major's case to a member state because uh, our law does not give us that power, which I think is, is a little bit sad. But I think as she said yesterday in the, in the proposed amendments, we want to make it very clear that even us can refer a case to to a member state without, without waiting for that member state to request for that referral. For sometimes they may not know about the, they may know about the transaction, but they may not have much, much more details as we would have if we've received it for them to, to trigger that uh, uh, Article 24.8 of a referral. So yeah. we may have much more information that they may not have. So we should have that authority to refer as well while we think Zimbabwe, for example, be the one to be affected much more than the rest of the common market. Yeah. So I suppose, I mean, um, this will be a question to, to the, all the regulators um, here, so I'll, I'll spare my partner, Walia. Oh, thank you. Um, is, so, I mean, one of the things that Tamara Paramu mentioned yesterday was the amount of time she spends on the call, on, on the phone or email with the FTC or the European Commission, but none with any really of the other regulators on the continent. Right. So, so what is what? What? Do, why do you think that's the case? That uh, uh, there hasn't been a lot of collaboration um, uh, between competition regulators in, in, in investigating cases, um, or and or whether are we are we going to start seeing that? Uh, and I want to be very careful here because I'm in South Africa, right? <laughs> so, but I think uh, uh, Tamara's uh, 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 comment yesterday would be a little bit more specific to South Africa, not talking more to the other regulators uh, uh, in Africa. Because to the best of my knowledge, I think uh, we, we chat a lot with uh, Rafael. Uh, Mr. Francis Kariuki, the Director General of CAK, will be coming to Malawi to see me on the 1st of March. And among the issues we, are, we, we will be chatting about how we collaborate more, how we investigate, we investigate cases together uh, 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 um, Mburu, the last time I was with him in some conference, I can't remember uh, where it was an online conference. I recall him saying, don't be surprised if you see me at Comesa 
reviewing uh, and working with the colleagues at Comesa Competition Commission, reviewing a major, because those are some of the things, for example, we've put in, a, in our MOUs where staff can be at. So there's quite a lot of, uh, uh, and maybe Mburu uh, uh, will say that, uh, and then uh, my, my colleague from Angola, but from the Comesa Competition point of view, we think there's a lot of interaction with national competition authorities. And I think there's a lot of interaction between competition authorities in Comesa, not just with the Comesa Competition Commission. So I think, uh, sir, it's uh, South Africa that should up up its game to engage more with uh, other competition authorities uh, 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 in Africa. But maybe Mburu may, may, may have something to add on that. Thanks. And uh, from the Kenyan perspective, I would say see it in two ways. First, the, the heavy reliance on the likes of you as the West and FTCU is because of, first of all, you're looking at technical experience. You find when you're a young agency, you're looking at up at them as big brothers to actually assist you in some of the matters that have been handled before. So that cooperation could be seen to be very broad. And also because of the resources the agencies have there, you'd find they're spending more. Their international relations is more towards training staff and equipping them with skills. But as, as the agencies in Africa are growing, we are moving away from relying on them to actually now being interagency cooperation where we are assisting each other to build on cases. The amount of times Kenya has cooperated with South Africa, every, every week, I believe we have an email from Comesa, we are dealing with, with, Amasa, with Amata jointly. So it, it's now moving away from EU and actually understanding that our challenges in Africa are our own unique challenges that we have to get our own solutions. If I look like now at the digital economy, whatever is happening in Europe is completely different from what we have in Kenya. I've always come from a school of thought like, if for instance, there was no Android in Kenya, how many people would actually have 5G, 4G network? How many people could afford a smartphone? The switching cost of $550 is enough for me to buy a new phone. Can I move from my phone to Android very easily? No. So I'd find the challenges that are there in Europe and the West are completely different from what we have here in Africa. And we have to get our own solutions for mm. our own problems. So we, we can no longer copy paste that. So I find even the times we are in, we will not actually be, it's not us to change from relying heavily on them, but will be forced by circumstances. That it's better for me to rely on what is happening in South Africa and Kenya, because even the companies moving from South Africa to Kenya, CFTA is happening. So there will be more regional integration across both tripartite. Yeah. So we have to really focus on ourselves rather than seeing from that region. And also now, I believe Kenya now is becoming like also a big brother. Angola, we are already, I think there's something being talked about. Congo, we are going back, we're going there. We'll have joint trainings to, yeah. to assist them to set up. Ethiopia had uh, in the past sent its uh, experts to come to Kenya for I think one month for training. Yeah. So we are finding more of collaboration locally rather than us thinking of going outside yeah. the, the continent. Yes, um, <laughs> yes. Uh, for, from Angola perspective, there is uh, two issues. One of them is the language. Another one is, is the legal system because we are in Southern Africa and our system is Romanic and you have another law system. So we start with Portugal and Brazil because of the language and it's easier for us. And also the Portuguese authority, maybe that we are so formal, <laughs> asked to us in the first year and invite the, the boards and part of uh, executive departments to training uh, to training us uh, that was very important to us um, but we also are connected with uh, another um, regulators by the informal network such uh, ICN and AFC uh, where the first time I knew Rafael in Gambia uh, but also we are trying to make a protocol with uh, South Africa Competition Commission. We are discussing the drafting of the protocol, but it's our um, priority in the region. Uh, also, we have a, a program for this year. Uh, we stopped because of the pandemic and to ask for, 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 for workshops, inviting people for another uh, authorities, especially the older ones and also send our people to, to training. I think we'll open up to the floor. We've got, I think, 15 minutes um, and then for questions. In listening to uh, Judge speaking and uh, Derek, I was reflecting on something that uh, we've had to bet before. And this relates to 
uh, an ideal situation versus a practical issue. So where I'm coming from is that we currently, the world world over, we are in a VUCA world, right? And parliament, governments are focused entirely on emergencies and things that are coming up. Competition law is hardly on the agenda and is unlikely to be on the agenda for a long time. They have, as governments, uh, bodies like Competition Commission, et cetera, et cetera, to look after the interests of the public. And therefore, in the approach to interpretation of uh, competition issues, I'm hearing, oh, we want parliament to be more explicit, parliament to do this, so that uh, the agencies just follow what parliament has uh, legislated. But the reality is that that's not going to happen because the focus is not on competition law, but on other issues. So my musings and reflection are leading me to say, perhaps we should be more tolerant and actually accept the reality that if we are going to be protecting the public, if our interest is the public, we shouldn't really be focusing on the technicalities, but rather saying, what are we seeking to achieve? And therefore, the debate becomes how much leeway should the agencies have to achieve the objective that all of us agree on, as opposed to say, actually, the law says this and we must stick to it. And if parliament doesn't do anything, then the public doesn't benefit in the long term. I don't know whether you are understanding what I'm saying that there should be a lot more tolerance in relation to what the agencies are doing because they are still an arm of government. Yes, they're not parliament, but they're an arm of government seeking an objective that benefits the public. And therefore, whatever they do is an extension. But yes, it's not pure because parliament has not quite legislated that way. Thank Thanks, you. George. Thank you. Um, before we uh, answer that question, um, do we have any uh, another question? Hi, I'm Ryan Hawthorne. I'm from Acacia Economics. Um, I was wondering. We've been doing some work uh, on the continent, and uh, do you do you see much by way of negotiation around uh, around regional? Um, uh, uh, Competition law uh, enforcement, but but from an AFTA, AFTA perspective, the the free the continental free trade agreement perspective. So I was just wondering whether you are seeing any uh, sort of uh, movement in that direction. Whether you're seeing any negotiations towards um, a, a full Africa wide uh, regional competition authority, or, or whether that's kind of uh, that's not really an activity that's that the authorities are really uh, engaged in at the moment. Sure. Um, I think it's a, it's a pity that uh, the AU uh, heads of state decided to hold a meeting in Addis Ababa last week, and therefore the, the, the Secretary General of the AFCFTA couldn't travel down. He was supposed to be here, but couldn't make it. He would have been able to answer that question, but the heads of state got in the way. Um, uh, you know, they, they should plan better next time. <laughs> so, um, but as far as I'm aware, yes, certainly the... Um, uh, the, the second round of the AFCA negotiations have already commenced, um, which include the protocol on competition. But, but um, at least as, as, as the, the intelligence we have is that there isn't a plan in that protocol for a continental regulator. Um, and you can imagine, it, I mean, you just add another layer of complexity. We're still trying to figure out, Kamesa, what, what the uh, tripartite is going to do, what e, how EAC fits in. And so there's a lot of moving parts at, at uh, national as well as uh, the regional economic communities, which are obviously um, key aspects of the continental agenda. So that, I think, needs to be sorted out first. But from a policy perspective, as well as, I suppose, sort of putting a continental framework, that's going to be in place, but not a regional regulator, unless anyone else on the panel has a different... Uh, yeah, in 
Oh, I think uh, you are, you you are you are right, uh, uh, Tolan. I I practiced your name uh, <laughs> starting last week, and I was doing very well when I was at home. And to now, I can't uh, call any. But uh, yeah, I think you are you you are right. And um, obviously, those talks are there. Competition protocols under the tripartite and the continental free trade area. But there's no clear direction on whether we are having um, an enforcement model competition authority yeah. or simply cooperation. So those are things that are still in discussion. And in my view, I think we should uh, be very careful with what we are doing now. We should understand the implications very well of what we are doing. Mm-hmm. I, I think we shouldn't be in a hurry to start putting things and signing things which later in on will start bringing debates on whether the, that competition protocol at continental level is binding in South Africa or not. Yeah. So I think this time we should, we, because you see, we shouldn't be so much in a hurry to sign things whose implications we don't understand. You're in a hurry to sign the Commissar Treaty and the Commissar Competition Regulations. And when it comes, you're the same guy saying, no, wait a minute, it's not binding here. I find that to be very strange, uh, to say the <laughs> truth. I find that to be very strange. So I think uh, at, the, at, the, at the continental level and the tripartite level, uh, my view, and I think that's a cautious approach that, is, uh, uh, that countries are taking, my view is that let's understand exactly the implications of whatever we are going to come up with. If it is uh, 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 enforcement, a binding model, we should understand and implement that from day one after signing. Not after signing, then we start changing colors. I think that would be that would be my point. But I agree with what Tolani is saying. Okay, and I think the 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 remarks from from George really were. Uh, I took him as asking the question: as regulators, do you feel constrained in any way um, to achieve what you believe to be the objectives of the of the regulator? whether from uh, that the law doesn't give you enough tools in your toolbox or whether institutionally you're just boxed in um, or, you know, or, or whether there's uh, just too much pushback. Um, so I, I suppose that's a question for the regulators, whether you feel constrained um, somehow in achieving your objectives. I, I Rafael, think, let's I, think I, can go. I, I feel like uh, I completely agree. There's no one single day you'll have that, you'll have all the, the laws you require to implement everything. It's, it's more of with what you have, what do you achieve with that? Like I'll give an example of Kenya where we are really focusing on using research and making proper papers for recommendation that actually end up changing regulations and law ultimately. A good example is we did a research jointly with Central Bank of Kenya into digital payment platforms. And one of the recommendations was picked up and actually the amendments to the act happened through the Central Bank Act rather than the Competition Act. We didn't seek to get any powers. And we are seeing there will be benefits to it. I will tell you clearly that digital payment platforms have been, digital lending platforms in Kenya have been really a, a real issue. But uh, I would be seated here and I'm getting messages being told that uh, Kolani refused to pay his loan. Now, uh, because I'm his friend, I should be telling him to pay that loan. And you have seen within one month of the implementation of that, I'm not getting those phone calls. I'm not getting those messages. So actually what we wanted to achieve at the end for the consumer is actually being achieved without changing anything in the competition law, but taking it to the right place for it to be amended. So I find competition agencies really need to focus on research, inform on what is happening in the market and see within their laws, what can they achieve first? And what is now the, the, the what is, is lacking before you go for the amendment? I don't want to copy paste because the commercial has this. I have also to achieve my law to look like this. But what have I done with what I have currently? I believe before Kenya, before we did our first don't read, there was so much back and forth that what does the law say? What are our limits and everything? And then until one day we decide, look, we are doing this thing. We, we are not waiting anymore. Let's everything that comes with it. And still, even if we do, then later, 10 years down the line, I feel like there will still be legal challenges to it. But does it mean that you'll not be doing them? Mm. You continue doing them, and now you face the challenges as they come in. And so, so I feel like we have tools currently to achieve what you want. It's only that how do you make them be broad enough for you? And how do you get collaborators who can really assist you in achieving your goal? So because if today I want to push an agenda as just Competition Authority of Kenya, on digital platforms uh, alone. Do I really reach the objective? No, but if I use Central Bank, I use World Bank, I use other people around it, is that the agenda is achieved even with faster and less resources. So it's more of a collaborative approach that really assisting on that. Fantastic. Yes. Adalberto, what is the position in Angola? <laughs> uh, 
we have a problem that people sometimes doesn't understand us. So, but we are making steps because this, this come from political desire. We have the principle of um, defense of competition on the new constitution since uh, 2010, but only on 2018, the government decided to enforce the, the principle uh, submitting the, the Competition Act and all kinds of regulation to implement. Uh, and this was because we had um, economic problems, financial problems, and the government understand that need to, to change things on the way that we are governing on economics. So we think that it's a um, replay of the time and the strength of our work and maybe we can change the minds, even the politicals. Another thing is, if we became uh, independent, we deal directly with the National Assembly. So uh, all our work will syndicated by, for administrative purposes, to the National Assembly and the other to the court. So we think that could be easier to talk um, and to change the mindset. Yeah, yeah no, thanks. Uh, 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 George, good to see you after a long time. Good. I didn't recognize you in the yellow mask until you spoke, so yeah, good to see you after a long time. Look, uh, 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 from our perspective, I think the, the, the bottom line is what is the objective of the commercial competition regulation? I think we are driven by that. Uh, and I have my own variant of the U.S. Declaration of Independence penned by Thomas Jefferson in 1776, I think, if I recall my history, uh, where it says uh, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident uh, 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 that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their uh, creator with certain un unalienable rights. That's the right to liberty, the right, the right to life, and the, uh, the right to a pursuit of happiness. I have my own variant to competition law on that, that uh, all frames and undertakings are created equal and they are endowed with those inalienable rights in terms of the right to uh, exist in a distorted market, in free and liberalized markets. Those, that is my variant, of the, my variant <laughs> of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. And if you look at that as the objective, uh, uh, really, as long as you are doing everything and anything within the confines of the law, pursuing that objective, that undertaking should be uh, free to engage in a market that is not riddled with uh, uh, anti-competitive conduct, I think it's good enough for us. The, 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 the amendments that we seek are simply to make this system much more effective and more efficient, not that what we have currently cannot work. And as Mburu says, uh, if, if Commercial Competition Commission in 2013 sat down and listened to all these criticisms of how it can't work, how the law is bad, there would be no commercial today. But I think people who were there then were bored enough to say, this is the law today, and we we'll implement it as it is. So I think that would be uh, my, my, my position to your, to your comment, George. Thank you, everyone. This then brings the But Tolani, before we come to an okay. end, there's a, there, there's a question. <laughs> There's a question uh, or a, a, a matter that I think would be very important to address here for both the lawyers and, uh, and, and, and your clients. And I think this is the issue of uh, Egypt, Tunisia, and Ethiopia. I don't know how you forgot about that. But uh, you see, Tolan has been troubling me. What is the status of the Ethiopia, Egypt, and Tunisia? Because we have been asked to notify uh, in Egypt. We have been asked to notify in Ethiopia. We have been asked to notify in uh, uh, which is the other country. Uh, Tunisia. Yeah. So I think I, I, I thought I should clarify on that quickly on those three countries. The first one would be Ethiopia. To the best of our knowledge, there is no double notification in Ethiopia. And I say this because, one, look, we've had three CEOs of the uh, Trade Competition and Consumer Protection Authority of uh, Ethiopia, three CEOs who sat on our board. And every time we've raised this question to them that we are receiving these questions from lawyers, they've said that does not exist. That's, in fact, one of them got so annoyed and said, this is the last time I'm, it was in a board meeting. So this is the last time I'm answering that question because now I'm fed up with you guys telling us that thing does not exist. 
And then, uh, look, uh, Derek and I uh, were privileged to be in Ethiopia at one point on a case involving Coca-Cola, if I recall. And one of the issues that arose uh, in the Ethiopian tribunal then was uh, the, 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 what is the status of the regulations in Comesa? I think the Ethiopian uh, adjudicative bench then had said, uh, even if there was Comesa transactions needed to be notified in Ethiopia. But when that was appealed to the uh, uh, tribunal, appellate tribunal in, uh, in Ethiopia, that issue was overturned and the tribunal was very clear that once notifications are made at Comesa, uh, you don't need to notify in Ethiopia. And I think that's the position, Derek, in as far as uh, I remember. And I was very clever this time to bring one of my officers who recently joined uh, us from the, uh, from the Ethiopian Competition Authority. I brought him here so that when I speak, he's there, you look at him and you'll be able to, you'll be able to attest that I'm not lying because then I'll be lying. In his so he's there, yeah, I'm sure he understands it. So I think it's a matter of, uh, number one, maybe dealing with new staff there who may not understand exactly what is happening, dealing with local council who also may not appreciate what is happening. And we've always asked lawyers, if you have an issue like that, please bring it to us and we table it with the Ethiopians. And none has, has done that. Egypt, I think there's been a confusion because Egypt has also been telling us exactly the same thing that look once a major is not in fact they've brought majors to us there's a and there's a there's a uh, case on uber egypt brought it to us actually so they've said once a transaction is notified at commerce there is no uh, major notification in the context of reviewing that major and issuing a decision in egypt the notification that is there is what i may uh, probably compared to what is happening in Kenya, because in Kenya, even if the notification comes to Comesa and Comesa will review that if it has regional dimension, you still need to inform the authority, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, Rafael, that there's this transaction that is taking place. It's not notification in terms of review. It's exactly the same uh, uh, situation in Egypt, and the Egyptians have been very clear to us on that over and over and over. Tunisia is a slightly different situation. Tunisia only joined Comesa, I think, in about 2019, if I'm not mistaken. Then uh, uh, later on, there were all these COVID issues. So governments sometimes when they enter into these agreements, it's not automatic that immediately everyone uh, down there understand what is happening. So I went to, to Tunisia in November last year. Uh, I was there and I realized they had no clue of what was happening. And in fact, there was even a, a, some, a, some other confusion in that in Tunisia, the Minister of Trade actually is responsible for competition matters and also majors, but they also have a separate competition authority that also reviews majors and, uh, and, and other... Com so even within Tunisia, there was that confusion. So when you added the commercial layer, they were even more confused. But uh, that doesn't mean that something won't happen uh, Tunisia joined the, the Comesa recently. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in Tunisia itself for them to understand all those issues. But Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, uh, the story is settled. Tunisia, it's a matter of informing them exactly the obligations under the treaty, which they did not understand. So I thought I should make that very clear. No, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for all your time and listening to us.